welcome to the third last of our presentations on this uh, series of uh, the prophets and the messengers. This is the series, uh, the prophets and the messengers, and this is the third last presentation. And so I welcome you as uh, we go through the last materials. It has been a journey looking unto the old and the New Testament prophets, and then uh, the non-canonical uh, prophets, and uh, I majored so much on now. Uh, the life and the ministry of E.G. White, he experienced this, what she had to go through and the battles she had to uh, to wage. And um, it has been uh, a journey and we are coming to an end. But um, what I'm learning is that uh, it doesn't always mean that uh, when you have a gift, or God puts you in a certain office that uh, all temptations, all sorrows shall not come to unto you. But uh, the positions we are placed in are the very positions that shape our character and even will work out unto our salvation or um, our loss. And so we have seen how she has endured all that has happened in the denomination. And uh, just let us see her last years and uh, what she had to say. But before that, uh, I'd like us to pray. Our Heavenly Father, after all has been said and done, the only thing that we shall be asked, what did we do with the life that we were given? And so it has been a precious moment going through these materials. Help us, Lord, to move closer to Thee. And uh, help us to be a light unto others in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I continue to believe that uh, it has been uh, a blessing unto us. And uh, the Lord who has called us is so faithful. And he will make us triumph just according to Philippians 1 6 that he who has called us, he who has started a good work in us, will accomplish it at the end. In the last presentation, uh, I looked at um, uh, E.G. White warning to, to uh, Daniel and Prescott on overhauling our books and then. Uh, I was able to look at um, the work Daniels was able to do in the latter time with Leroy Chrome. But then I'd like to read something in letter 50, 1906. Letter 50, 1906, something that um, captures my mind. She has something interesting to speak. All these truths are immortalized in my writings. The Lord never denies his word. Men may get up scheme after scheme, and the enemy will seek to seduce souls from the truth. But all who believe that the Lord has spoken through Sister White and has given her a message will be saved from the many delusions that will come in these last days. The only way for us to be safe and to be kept from uh, the delusions that um, will happen in these last days is to keep our feet steady in Christ. Because there will be many delusions in these last days. And uh, this is clear in the book, uh, uh, Matthew 24, that... Uh, they will appear false prophets. They will appear pro uh, false uh, prophets. And if it were possible to deceive even the elect, to deceive even. 
And so we must um, have our feet. Uh, we must have our feet plunged in uh, uh, standing on the solid ground. And I want just to run ahead when we are talking about about um, uh, there shall be deceptions in the last days. I just want to run ahead and uh, of myself and uh, read something in February 24, 1915, the year that uh, she died. She said, when waking out of sleep, she called the nurse to her side and said, I want to tell you, I hate, I want to tell you. I had seen repeated three times. I am charged to tell our people that some do not realize that the devil has device after device and he carries them out in a way that they do not expect. Certain agencies will invent ways to make sinners out of saints. I tell you now that when I am laid to rest, great changes will take place. I do not know when I shall be taken and I desire to warn all against the devices of the devil. I want the people to know that I want them fully before my death. I do not know especially what changes will take place, but they should watch every conceivable sin that Satan will try to immortalize. And so uh, in, in this place, she says that uh, all these truths are immortalized in my writings. But then again, she says uh, in letter, in MS1 1915, that um, uh, I do not know especially what changes will take place, but they should watch every conceivable sin that Satan will try to immortalize. So truth are immortalized, but what Satan is trying is to immortalize sin. You see how the two are at war with uh, each other. And so uh, for over two years prior to the accident that hastened her death, Miss White was freer from suffering and from common ailments than during any other like period in her lifetime. Once her strength failed decidedly, but soon she rallied and was again able to get about with comparative ease. Her attendant usually took her out driving every pleasant day and this afforded restful change. She was ordinarily able to go from upper room to her carriage unaided. But her frame was becoming more and more bowed with the weight of years and her friends could not hope for long continuance of life. In the spring of 1914, Miss White had the pleasure of meeting once more her son, Elder James Edson White, who spent some weeks in her home. Not long after his return, his mother suffered great weakness from a complication of difficulties and as a result, largely gave up reading. In the months that followed, she often had others read to her. Now, just to follow along this, the cessation of her ordinary activities, however, did not lead to diminish interest in the progress of the course of God throughout the world. The pages of the Review and Herald and uh, of other denominational papers were as precious to her as ever, and she continued to enjoy letters from old-time friends and often recounted with the uh, animation the experiences of former days. In the course of conversation held in uh, December, on December 1914, she referred to an accident that occurred many years before. A certain brother had expressed discouragement over the prospect of the extended and difficult work that would need to be done before the world could be prepared for the second advent of Christ. Another brother, one of the la of large, one of large faith, turned to him, his face white with strong emotion, and said, "My brother, do you permit such a prospect to be bring discouragement? Do you not know that God will have us press the battle to the gate? Do you not know?" He will have us labor on and on and on, knowing that victory lies ahead. And uh, it was in early December 1914 also that she testified to hearing voices in the night season crying out, advance, 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 press the battle to the gates. While eager to continue her work and especially desirous of speaking again in public, Miss White knew that her strength was gradually failing and that she must not presume on her waning energies. This was a real trial to her, yet she felt resigned to the Lord's will. Here her praying around the family altar at set of sun, Sabbath 26, 1914, following petitions by Elder E.W. Fansworth and others. This was her prayer. Thou wilt answer our petition and we ask thee, Lord, for Christ's sake, if 
It is thy will to give me strength and grace to continue. Or I am perfectly willing to leave my work at any time that thou seest best. O Lord, I greatly desire to do some things. Thou knowest and will be willing to do them if thou wilt give me strength. But we will make no complaint because thou hast spared my life so much longer than many anticipated and that I have anticipated myself. Give us light, give us joy, give us the great grace that thou hast in store for the needy. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Fibla and still fibla grew the physical frame, but the spirit was courageous ever. In conversation with Dr. David Paulson on January 25, 1915, Ms. White said, The Lord has been my helper, the Lord has been my God, and I have not a doubt. If I could not realize that he has been my guide and my stay, do tell me what I can, could trust in. Why I have just as firm a trust in God that he will stand my feet on Mount Zion as that I live and breathe. And I'm going to keep that trust till I die. When on, uh, when on the 27th of January 1915, her son Willie White returned home after four months absent in the East and the South, she was apparently as strong as when he had left. She was still enjoying a good degree of comfort health-wise and was able to be bowed. Some two weeks later, only the day before she was stricken, uh, she spent a little time walking in the yard with him and conversing on the general interest of the cause of God. And it was on Sabbath day, February 13, 1915, 1915 that Miss White met with the accident that confined her to her couch thereafter and hastened her death. As he was entering her study from the hallway about noon, she apparently tripped and fell. Her niece, Miss May Walling, who for a time had been acting as a nurse, was close by in the hallway and hastened to her assistance. As efforts to help her to her feet proved un unavailing, Miss Walling raised her into a chair, drew the chair through the hallway into the bedroom, and finally got her on the bed and summoned a physician from St. Helena Sanitarium. A preliminary examination by Dr. G. E. Klingham, Klingerman was followed by a more thorough examination by means of the X-ray. And this revealed unmistakably an intracapsular fracture of the left femur. It was, of course, impossible to determine when the break in the bone had taken place, whether before the fall, thus causing Miss White to drop to the floor, or as the result of the fall. The restlessness of the next few days and nights was accompanied with very little pain. In fact, from the very first, the Lord mercifully spared his aged servant the severe pain that ordinarily comes with such injuries. The usual symptoms of shock also were absent. The respiration, the temperature, and the circulation were nearly normal. Dr. Klingerman and Dr. B.F. Jones, his associate, did all that medical science could suggest to make their patient comfortable. But at her advanced age, they could hold out but little prospect of ultimate recovery. All through the weeks and months of her last sickness, Miss White was buoyed up by the same faith and hope and trust that had characterized her life experience in the days of her vigor. Her personal testimony was uniformly cheered and her courage strong. She felt that her times, that her times were in the hand of God and that his presence was with her continually. Not, a long, not long after she was rendered helpless by the accident, she testified of her savior. Jesus is my blessed Redeemer, and I love him with my whole being. And again, I see light in his mercy and love in his love. To Miss Sarah McEntefa, for many years her secretary, she said, If only I can see my Savior face to face, I shall be fully satisfied. In an interview with another, she said, My courage is grounded in my Savior. My work is nearly ended. Looking over the past, I do not feel the least might of despondency or discouragement. I feel so grateful that the Lord has withheld me from despair and discouragement and that I can still hold the banner. I know him whom I love and in whom my soul uh, trusted. Referring to the prospect of death, she declared, I feel the sooner the better. All the time that is how I feel. The sooner the better. I have not a discouragement a discouraging thought, nor sadness. I have nothing to complain of. Let the Lord take his way and do his work with me so that I may, so that I am refined and purified. And that is all I desire. I know my work is done. 
it is of no use to say anything else. I shall rejoice when my time comes that I am permitted to lie down to rest in peace. I have no desire that my life shall be prolonged. Following a prayer by the one who was making these notes of her conversation, she prayed, Heavenly Father, I come to thee weak like a broken reed, yet by the Holy Spirit's vindication of righteousness and truth that shall prevail. I thank thee, Lord, I thank thee, and I will not draw away from anything that thou wouldest give me to bear. Let thy light, let thy joy and grace be upon me in my last hours, that I may glorify thee, is my great desire, and this is all that I shall ask of thee. Amen. This humble, trustful prayer by one who long had been a chosen vessel in the master's service was fully honored. Hers was the comfort that causes a child of the great father of light and love to fear no evil, even while passing through the valley of the shadow of death. One Sabbath day, only a few short weeks before she breathed her last, she said to her son, I am very weak. I am sure that this is my last sickness. I am not worried at the thought of dying. I feel comforted all the time that the Lord is near me. I am not anxious. The preciousness of the Savior has been so plain to me. He has been a friend. He has kept me in sickness and in health. I do not worry about the work I have done. I have done the best I could. I do not think that I shall be lingering long. I do not expect much suffering. I am thankful that we have the comforts of life in time of sickness. Do not worry. I go only a little before the others. The comfortable office room on the second store of Miss White Home was the most favorable place for patients and nurses. And here it was that she lay the most of the time, surrounded by the familiar objects of the more active life to which she had so long been accustomed. The room was light and airy. In one corner, a large bay window flooded a portion of the chamber or the chamber with sunshine. Here stood her old writing chair. This was transformed into a reclining chair into which she was lifted nearly every day after the first week or two of illness had passed by. The view from this sunny corner was pleasing and varied and she greatly enjoyed the changing beauties of springtime and early summer. Close beside her chair on a table were kept several of the books she had written. These she would often handle and look over seemingly or seeming to let light in having them near. Like an affectionate mother with her children, so was she with these books during her last sickness. Several times when visited, she was found holding two or three of them in her lap. I appreciate these books as I never did before. She at one time remarked, they are truth and they are righteousness, and they are an everlasting testimony that God is true. She rejoiced in the thought that when she could no longer speak to the people, her books will speak for her. At times when her strength permitted, she was taken in a wheelchair to sunny veranda on the upper floor. From this little balcony, embowered with beautiful climbing roses, the panorama of orchard and vineyard of mountains and valleys afforded continual pleasure. Again and again, during the earlier weeks of her illness, her voice was lifted in song. The words often chosen were, we have heard from the bride, the holy land, we have heard and our hearts are glad, for we were a lonely pilgrim band and weary and worn and sad. They tell us the pilgrims have a dwelling there, no longer are homeless ones, and we know that the godly, goodly land is fair, where life's pure river runs. We will we'll be there, we'll be there in a little while, we'll join the pure and the blessed, we'll have the palm, the robe, the crown, and forever be at rest. About a fortnight after her accident, she was told of the missionary and bookman's convention in session at Mountain View, where plans were being laid for an increased circulation of denominational publications. This reference to the bookman led her to express once more the pleasure she had had two years before in uh, greeting many of them personally in her own home. I am very glad, she added for all they are doing for the circulation of our books. The publishing branch of our course has much to do with our power. I do desire that it shall accomplish all that the Lord designs it should. If uh, our bookmen do their part faithfully, I know from the Lord God, light God has given me 
that the knowledge of the present truth will be double and tri um, trebled. This is why I have been in so much of a hurry to get my books out so that they could be placed in the hands of the people and read. And in the foreign languages, the Lord designs that uh, the circulation of our books shall be greatly increased. Thus, we shall be placing the course of present truth on vantage ground. But let us remember, in all our endeavors, we must seek daily power and individual Christian experience. Only as we keep in close touch with the source of our strength shall we be enabled to advance rapidly and along even lines. Many were the visitors, old acquaintances and others, who came to greet Mr. White during the last few months of her life. Sometimes he was unable to recognize all associates in labor. At other times, she knew those who came. Whenever possible, she would converse with them. She never ceased to take delight in testifying of God's goodness and tender mercy. For months prior to her illness, she frequently quoted the scripture. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And she felt strengthened every time she bore witness to the love of God and to his watchful care. And so... This is uh, the third last presentation in the series, um, the, pro the Prophets and the Messengers. And uh, we are looking at um, the last days of E.G. White and her words. After going through her experiences from the time that she was 17 years, the battling with the various powers at Battle Creek, how she advanced the work, how she responded to those who were erring, and uh, this is just a, pre a presentation on comfort that uh, after all the battles, we can still have the last moments, a peaceful moments and uh, moments that we are assured that uh, the next thing we shall be seeing is Christ coming in the clouds of the air. And um, continued on, on one Sabbath afternoon when the family of Hassan Willie White spent one Sabbath afternoon, when the family of her son, Willie White, spent some time with her, she was especially blessed and spoke many words of counsel to her grandchildren. And uh, the Lord is very good to us, she declared. And if we follow on to know the Lord, we shall know that his going forth is prepared as the morning. If there is any question in your minds in regard to what is right, look to the Lord Jesus and he will guide you. We should bring every plan to the Lord to see if he approves it. Remember that the Lord will carry us through. I am guarding every moment so that nothing may come between me and the Lord. I hope there will not. God grant that we may all prove faithful. There will be a glorious meeting soon. I am glad that you have come to see me. May the Lord bless you. Amen not alone for her granddaughters and grandsons, but for all the youth throughout the denomination, her heart went out in loving solicitude. At times she talked with her nurses and with her office helpers concerning the need of making wise selections of matter for the youth to read. We should advise the young, she urged, to take hold of such a reading matter as recommends itself for the upbuilding of Christian character. The most essential points of our faith should be stamped upon the memory of the young, they have had a glimpse of this truth, but not such an acquaintance as would lead them to look upon their study with favor. Our youth should read that which will have a healthful, sanctifying effect upon the mind. This they need in order to be able to discern what is true religion. There is much good reading that is not sanctifying. Now is our time and opportunity to labor for the young people. Tell them that... We are now in perilous crisis and we want to know how to discern true godliness. Our young people need to be helped, uplifted and encouraged, but in the right manner, not perhaps as they will desire it, but in a way that will help them to have sanctified minds. They need good sanctifying religion more than anything else. I do not expect to live long. My work is nearly done. Tell our young people that I want my words to encourage them in that manner of life that will be most attractive to the heavenly intelligence. The end came on Friday, July 16, 1915 at 3.40 p.m. in the sunny upper chamber of her El Shaven, home where she had spent so much of her time during the last happy, fruitful years of her busy life. 
She fell asleep in Jesus as quietly and peacefully as a weary child goes to rest. Surrounded, surrounding her bedside were her son, Elder W.C. White, and his wife, her granddaughter, Miss Mabel White Workman, her longtime and faithful secretary, Miss uh, Sarah McEntefa, her niece and devoted nurse, Miss May Walling, another of her art and tiring beside bedside nurses, Miss Carrie Hungerford, her housekeeper, Miss Stacy Woodbury, her all-time companion and helper, Miss Mary Chinock Top, and a few friends and helpers who had spent many years in and about her home and in her office. For several days prior to her death, she had been unconscious much of the time, and toward the end, she seemed to have lost the faculty of speech and that of hearing. The last words she spoke to her son were, I know whom I have believed. And so it is interesting to see the last years of E.G. White, how she spent them, and uh, you don't find some gloomy uh, interaction in her last day, but uh, a prospect of uh, a better future when even sin shall be eradicated. And so uh, it is important to look at her biography and uh, be encouraged uh, during our years of uh, affliction. But um, the death of E.G. White opened another chapter in the life of Adventism. And uh, I just want to go through a little history, Adventism at crossroads without a prophet. They had been having a prophet amongst them. There was a time when they were tired with her testimonies and sent her in Australia for nine years. But she came back because alive because the Lord wanted so. She continued her writing, but in 1915, she rested in the Lord. But since her demise, and without a living prophet, Adventism has gone through a lot of things, but uh, I won't go through all of them, but just a little of the history of that time as uh, we try to bring this series to its end. So Adventism at Crossroads Without a Living Prophet, a little history from 1915 to 1989 by Herbert E. Douglas. And uh, this is in the book, uh, The Messenger of the Lord, because of God's plan to unfold truth as fast as his people are able to understand it, each generation is blessed with additional truth. Thus, we know more today about God's will than did earlier generations. Not that truth is evolving in some kind of evolutionary scheme, but our perception of truth is continually progressing. Within the Bible story, we find a built-in capacity for self-correction of understanding. The Old Testament understanding of God's plan for this world and how he will intervene and create a new world, was clarified in later revelations in the New Testament. This is a practical example of how God always meets people where they are, yet knows all along where he is going. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a forward-looking church. It is members and leaders have not let the past be the measure for the future. The primary value of the past has been in its unique ability to reveal the leading of God and his big picture that he is constantly unfolding. Through the years of Ellen White uh, was constant, consistently ahead of the leaders. I'll repeat, through the years, Ellen White was consistently ahead of the leaders. She had the ideas and the energy to set them before the people. What was the reason? She understood by concept and experience that God is always leading his people into greater light as fast as they are able to receive it, as fast as they are willing to obey it. Miss White was opposed to a creedal approach to Adventist doctrine. During the 1888 General Conference, resolutions were proposed that nothing should be taught in the college contrary to what has been taught. She noted that she felt deeply, for I knew whoever framed that resolution was not aware of what he was doing. Such a resolution will not only perpetuate errors then taught, for example, verbal inspiration of the Bible, but will also slam the door against the spirit of God who might have further light for honest truth seekers. In another letter from, uh, in another letter, Ellen White wrote, I could not let the resolution pass that nothing should be taught in the college but that which had been taught during the past year. 
that uh, there was to be special light for God's people as they neared the closing scenes of this earth history. Another angel was to come from heaven with a message and the whole earth was to be lightened with his glory. It will be impossible for us to state just how this additional light will come. It might come in a very unexpected way, manner, in a way that will not agree with the ideas that many have conceived. It is not all at all unlikely or contrary to the ways and works of God to send light to his people in unexpected ways. Would it be right that every avenue should be closed in our school so that the students could not have the benefit of this light? The resolution was not called for. For Ellen White, the best way to deal with error is to present the truth, to paper over discussion with the resolution that often concealed opposition to truth and serious discord was not her way. She spoke also to the present generation where she addressed the 1888 general conference session. No one must be permitted to close the avenues whereby the light of truth shall come to the people. As soon as this shall be attempted, God's spirit will be quenched, for the spirit is constantly at work to give fresh and increased light to his people through his word. Christians until the end of the time and throughout eternity will be listening to the spirit as he continues to build on the tree of truth which with new branches that extend the broad outlines understood in the past. Message of Light, page 422 to uh, 26 to 423.4, quoted. In Battle Creek, uh, October 5, 1861, when the Michigan Conference was organized, the wording of the resolution included covenanting to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Some felt strongly that even this word suggested a creed. J.N. Lofboro declared that the first step of our apostasy is to get up a creed telling us what we shall believe. The second is to make that creed a test of fellowship. The third is to try members by the creed. The fourth is to denounce as heretic those who do not believe that such creed. And fifth, to commence persecution against such. I plead that we are not patterning after the churches in and warrant the bosend in the step proposed. After others spoke, James White in his inimitable fashion made a comprehensive statement that had lasting significance. It included, I take the ground that creeds stand in direct opposition to the gifts. Let us suppose a case. We get up a creed stating just what we shall do in reference to this thing and that and say that we will believe the gifts too. But suppose the Lord through the gifts, should give us some new light that did not harmonize with our creed. Then, if we remain true to the gifts, it knocks out creed all over at once. Making a creed is setting the stakes and barring up the way to all future advancement. God put the gifts into the church for a good and great object, but men who have got up their churches have shut up the way or have marked out a course for the Almighty. They say virtually that the Lord must not do anything further than what has been marked out in the creed. A creed and the gifts that stand in direct opposition to each other. Now, what is our position as a people? The Bible is our creed. We reject everything in the form of human creed. We take the Bible and the gift of the Spirit, embracing the faith that, thus Lord, that the Lord will teach us from time to time. And in this, we take a position against the, reformation, the formation of a creed. We are not taking one step in what we are doing toward becoming Babylon. Now, it is important to note this issue of uh, the creed and Babylon because in uh, this uh, here, some things that we have to look to are uh, what E.G. White said about these creeds and uh, the changes that will take uh the changes that uh, will take place. Um, talking about Babylon in um, 4SP, page 232, paragraph uh, 2, this is what she had to say about these creeds. 4SP, spirit, uh, the Spirit of Prophecy, volume 4, page 232, paragraph 2, she said, the term Babylon, derived from Babel and signifying confusion, is applied in scripture to the various forms of false or apostate religion. So we have 
Babylon is not only the spiritual Babylon of Rome, but also Babylon composes a posted religion. So if any religion is in apostasy, it is forming part of Babylon and the confusion. But the message announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to some religious body that was once pure and has become corrupt. It cannot apply, it cannot be the Romish church which is here meant, for that church has been in a fallen condition for many centuries. So when we are um, talking about um, the second angel's message, we are not talking about Rome. And when we come to Revelation chapter 18 to talk about come out of Babylon, we are told it is simply to come out of every false institution and uh, every kind of uh, apostate religion which has become a cage of unclean birds and a hateful spirit. And so it cannot be a Romish church in uh, Revelation chapter 14, the second angel's message, but also it cannot apply to Rome alone in chapter 18 of Revelation, but to all apostate religion, and we are being told, come out of every apostate institution. But how appropriate the figure as applied to the Protestant churches, and this is Paul's Protestantism. All professing to derive their doctrines from the Bible, yet divided into almost innumerable sects. The unity for which Christ prayed does not exist. Instead of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, there are numberless conflicting creeds and theories. Religious faith appears so confused and discordant that the world know not what to believe as truth. God is not in all this. It is the work of man, the work of Satan. If you check out the years after E.G. White's death, it's like she was the breaks to any kind of apostasy that could happen to the denomination. When she was alive, only individual school apostasies and not the all the church, all the church. But after her demise, now it is not only individuals apostatizing, but you can see that um, creeds are being adopted and false doctrines are being brought in. And these things are put as a test to the members of the churches. And if they do not subscribe to them, then there is a problem. And the, the, the bad thing is that uh, no room is left for dialogue upon these things because uh, the church has, um, the churches, and I'm not only referring to the mainstream churches, but uh, independent ministries, self-supporting ministries, every movement, it's like it has fallen into the hands of uh, the Grecian Empire where they have become infallible in everything. And uh, I'm glad that the Lord, during the loud cry, will call out his people. He calls them my people. He will call them out of all these false institutions that are existing, whether in mainstream churches, whether self-supporting ministries, whether independent ministries. And so these are the years talking about uh, uh, the years after E.G. White demise. Great changes to take place. The 1919 Bible Conference, one of the most heated sessions in Adventist history, discussed passionately topics as the Eastern Question, the Aryan Trinity Controversy, the Two Covenants, the Daily of Daniel 8, 11 to 13, beginning and ending of the 1260 years, and the King of the North in Daniel 11. At the heart of it was the issue of how to interpret Ellen White and her say on these topics. Should she be understood in the light of verbal or thought inspiration? Missing in the conference was W.C. White, but why? Herbert Douglas tries to give a glimpse of this. And one of the most denominational cases was the 1919 General Conference uh, session. But missing in that meeting was really White. The, the voice of the living prophet is gone. Adventism is now in a crisis, and we are having a General Conference session. What will be of it? Number one. Some wonder why Willie White was not present at the 1919 meetings. As a member of the General Conference Committee, he was automatically a delegate and did receive the mimeographed invitation or mimeographed invitation. Perhaps after looking over the agenda, which included nothing on the work and relevance of Ellen White, he felt his time would be better spent in Elm Shaven uh, or Elm Shaven office. 
Working alone after his mother's staff had dispersed in 1915, no budget allotted by the trustees, not even provision for a letterhead, a Willie White felt pressure to finish compiling concepts on health to satisfy the request from medical leaders. If anyone had been able to predict that two long days of discussion that arose spontaneously would have been devoted to his mother's prophetic role, he doubtless would have made a greater effort to attend, but he never knew that that would be handled. This is Herbert Douglas reporting in Messenger of the Lord, page 438 to 439. Willie White, the most valuable source person available, could have answered some of the questions more accurately, more constructively than anyone else. Perhaps with his experience and uh, communicative skills, he could have helped to focus more clearly the issues uh, that were seriously dividing church leaders and lay people at that time and for years to come. The focus will have led to a careful forthright examination of the facts regarding the work of a prophet in modern times. Cutting away mistaken ideas will have been painful for some, but the healing will have been quicker and longer lasting than the widening gap of confidence that followed the conference cancer. However, another aspect must be considered. For many church leaders at the conference and in the field, Willie White was suspect and had been for 20 years as being one of the liberals. Why? Because he had been emphasizing that his mother's writing should always be understood in context with time, place, and circumstances, determining their meaning and application. Willie White with Daniels, Wilcox, and later Prescott represented those who were thought inspirationist, though that time had not been used at that time. Uh, often, at the heart of the controversy with Dr. J. H. Kellogg and A. T. Jones was the issue of how to interpret the statements of Ellen White. These two articulate leaders eventually used Miss White writing only when they seemed to support their views. Part of Jones' attack on Daniels was based on Miss White's comments regarding the unreliability of General Conference leadership in 1897 and then charging that the same statements applied in 1906. On other occasions, when they found difficulty with her writing, their response was that someone had told her wrong information. Often that someone was in their mind, her son, Willie White. And so you could see why she, he was not appreciated in that general conference session in 1919. And uh, the reason why he was not private to the things that were going to be discussed, if only he knew that her mother's writing will be discussed, then he will have been there without failure. So from 1919 to his death in 1937, Will White's contribution to the facts surrounding the prophetic ministry of his mother was enormously helpful. Number two, why Will White was not there? Beneath the differences of the delegates and many of the ministers and lay people in the churches over such agenda topics as the Eastern question, the Aryan Trinity controversy, the two covenants, the daily of Daniel 8, beginning and ending of 1260 years and the king of the north, Daniel 11, was the issue of how to interpret Ellen White. Accusations of disloyalty to her, of unfaithfulness to her authority by picking and choosing her writings as to what was inspired, of unsafe leaders leading the denomination down a fearful path without the guidance that she had given the denomination for 70 years, all such a spirited words directed at general conference officers and those among the teachers in the colleges who supported them did not bring out the best in people on either side. The conference council was charged with tension the moment it opened. At stake, each side believed was the authority of Ellen White. Those who believed in verbal inspiration and those who believed a thought inspiration. All of them thought that... Uh, they were the ablest defenders and uh, the believers in truth of uh, the authority of E.G. White. Each side further believed that on this issue would hang the future of the church, whether the church believes that uh, uh, she had um, her writings were verbal inspired or uh, the, her writings were thought inspired. There is a whole difference between verbal inspiration verbal inspiration you take the word as inspired and you cannot change it in any way thought inspiration is to get the concept of what somebody is saying and see how it's applicable to the circumstance that are uh, at that time and uh, even in the future number three uh the issues at stake 
and uh, Willie White missing that conference, both sides, verbal and thought inspirationist, had much of value to hold on to, but neither side saw the hard truth for which the other was contending. Thus, they missed the transcending healing nature of the, el uh, of the ellipse of truth. Neither side saw clearly the biggest reason why the ministry of Miss White had made such an enormous impact on their lives though each appeal to their own experience under her guidance as undeniable. Neither side could see clearly that her distinctive message, her coherent, integrating theological principles were the foundation of her guiding concept in education, health, mission, and the Adventist theological teachings. And so in 1919, you have the church being split into two. On the one side, we have verbal inspirationists, and on the other side, we have thought inspirationist. And this is a church being torn apart, and there's no living prophet amongst them. And the person who could help in this thing, he has not been made private to the matters which are at discussion. And so people are wallowing in circles in discussing these things. When E.G. White herself had said that uh, the Lord had shown her after the demise of her husband, her son Willie White, will be an ablest helper in her work. And so this crisis in 1999 could have been solved by the presence of Willie White to some extent. The foundation principles understood as the great controversy theme were the reason why the policies these leaders had followed were so effective. They had been living so close to the rapidly developing church and the equal rapidly rapid change in national and world condition that most of them had not stepped back far enough to see the bigger picture. Why? Because the living prophet was amongst them and if they could err, she was there to help them. But now he, she is not here. They didn't have the bigger picture of her writing and the worldview of uh, the theme of the great controversy. And now they are here stuck discussing about whether her writings are verbal inspiration or thought inspiration. Both sides saw this undeniable wonderful results in education, health, and rapid church growth, and they wanted to protect their divinely guided messenger from the use or misuse of her writings. Each side saw the other as the ultimate problem when they perceived what seemed to be a lack of appreciation for the gift of prophecy in their midst. And uh, there is nothing new under the sun. These are the circles that we go through every day. We have not learned from that conference until today as Seventh-day Adventists. One side takes a position and stands with it. Another one start, takes a position and stands with it. And, uh, you know, we can, uh, we, we can, we, we deny being part of the little horn. And I'm not saying that we are part of uh, the papal system. But I want just to bring about a concept. We deny being part of uh, the papal system. What is the greatest uh, 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 problem with the papal system or the little horn? When you go through Daniel chapter 7, actually, you get the little horn, it have eyes and a mouth speaking, but it doesn't have ears. This is, the, this is the system that we belong to. We have eyes and we can see things and in quotes more clearly. And after seeing them and uh, having a perception of them or uh, some decided concept about them, the only thing we can do is pick them out. But we as little horns, we don't have ears. We can't listen to anything. Once we hold something, it is cemented, and we take upon the infallibility of Egypt, Medo-Persia, and then Rome. All these characteristics of these fallen empires are still existing in our nature. And so the beast which is most dangerous is not the beast that we are waiting for when the Sunday law goes on. But it is the beast within us, which is selfishness and self, the beast of infallibility, which we have uh, inherited as a law of heredity. Because we have been under the rulership of these governments, we have inherited in our nature their character. We have in us Babylon. We have in us, in fact, we have in us Egypt, because we are prone so much in going back to Egypt. And uh, we have Babylon in us confusion every time and then we have actually medo passion as infallibility once we believe something nothing can change 
and then we have the element of Greece in us. There is a lot of philosophies we put behind what we believe and the concepts we have about life until you can differentiate between a Christian and a philosopher. We are like the Epicureans in the book of Acts who their work was to sit at the marketplace and hear something itchy and discuss about it all the day and have nothing to do. They were idlers. And Paul, speaking to them, he said that uh, we here among us two are busy bodies. They do not work. And our rule is that one who shall not work shall not eat. These were the kind of people were. And today we can say, no, we are not like the Epicureans. We work and we should eat. But then the part of philosophy is still in us. We like debating all day long. And uh, this brings me to uh, 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 some uh, thought that uh, there is no way we can keep the Sabbath holy, by the way. For in that command we are told, six days thou shalt work, but the seventh one is for the Lord, you shall rest in it. We are told, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And the next thing is six days thou shalt work. And so if our time is only consumed in debates and arguing about this and this, this is not work anymore. And then it will make us automatically, even though we may be in the Sabbath 24 hours of the day, but since we didn't work six days, and we are talking about profit, profitable work, then we are not keeping the Sabbath holy. For we have not worked the six days, which is enjoined to the keeping of the Sabbath holy, but we would want to come to the Sabbath 24 hours and keep it holy. We cannot because the things we have been doing during the six weeks of the day are the very things that are in our mind when we are in the presence of the Lord on the Sabbath. If it has been arguing, that is the same spirit. It has not posed, by the way. It is there only waiting for the time. So it is actively, it is unconsciously active uh, in, in us. And so we will never keep the Sabbath holy we, when we are not working the six days. Now, the, without losing my thought, and so each side saw the other as the ultimate problem when they perceived that what seemed to be a lack of appreciation for the gift of prophecy in their midst. And this is what we do. We don't learn how to appreciate even the people who differ with us. And uh, we went through the letter of uh, Daniels to Kellogg, and that letter should be an eye opener. When discussing the issue of the living temple with Kellogg, Daniel said, first what I'll do is tell you what we agree on and we say amen to it, then tell you the differences we have and see if we can sort them out. But today, when we differ, we go head on guns blazing. We do not lay the principle that um, uh, G.I. Butler, I mean, laid for Dr. Kellogg when he was writing The Living Temple, when uh, he, 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 he produced the book The Living Temple. Sit with somebody, agree to agree on the things that are correct, and then try to show the wrong. But uh, this attitude and character of uh, not uh, being able to reconcile the things that you agree on and then uh, uh, speak about the differences is not a, a good way of handling differences. So the 1919 conference was heated up because each side, the church split into two so that the other uh, side was the problem. Number four, but the downside of these two positions was played out in the lives of some of the most eloquent partisans. Many contributing influences affected Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, but probably none was more crucial than his understanding of how revelation and inspiration works. The eventual drift of A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagoner, spiritual heroes of 1888 and the early 1890s, was largely caused by the same misunderstanding. Kellogg and Jones especially held to a rigid concept of virtual verbal inspiration without using the contextual principle for understanding Miss White's statement. Now, what is the consequential um, principle for understanding Miss White that uh, we are talking about? Uh, I'll just show you what that uh, quote actually uh, implies. And uh, uh, time and place. The use of the testimonies. This is what we call contextual 
uh, principle of using the materials of EG White, which others did not use and uh, went ahead and uh, fell into the wrong path. Now, the use of testimonies, time and place to be considered. This is the context, the contextual use of the testimonies. Regarding the testimonies, nothing is ignored. Nothing is cast aside, but time and place must be considered. Nothing must be done untimely. Some matters must be withheld because some persons will make an improper use of the light given. Every jot and tittle is essential and must appear at an opportune time. In the past, the testimonies were carefully prepared before they were spent, sent out for publication and all uh, matter is still carefully studied after the first. Another thing that um, I like to put on the board is this. And uh, just uh, the people who took uh, the thought inspiration, uh, they had to be helped by this. In 1SM 39.3, that every word that Sister White spoke was inspired and it was verbal inspiration. Those who took that stand uh, did not read this actually. Uh, and uh, it is in 1, 1SM 1SM 39.3. And I'll just like to highlight it also. There are people who took all that Sister White wrote to be inspired verbally and nothing had to be changed from it. But here he, she had something to say. But there are times when common things must be stated Common thoughts must occupy the mind. Common letters must be written and information given that has passed from one to another of the workers. Such a word, such information are not given under the special inspiration of the Spirit of God. Questions are asked at times that are not upon religious subjects at all. And these questions must be answered. We conversed about houses and lands, trades to be made, and locations for our institution, their advantages and disadvantages. I receive letters asking for advice on many strange subjects, and I advise according to the light that has been given me. Men have again and again opposed the counsel that I have been instructed to give because they do not want to receive the light given, and such experiences have led me to seek the Lord most earnestly. And so the people who wanted to take her words verbally had a problem with those people who wanted to take her writings as thought inspiration. In thought inspiration, Actually, it is not every word that is inspired, but um, go through experiences that you have had, you can speak something that is right. For Paul says that these are not the Lord's words, but my words, but I believe that the Lord is leading me. There are common things but that must be talked in a common way. And so those who are holding to verbal inspiration so that um, those who had thought inspiration uh, did not respect the materials of E.G. White. Uh, and so, at time past, some of these otherwise able leaders had nothing to hang on to when they began to separate was what was inspired from that what, which was not. When they said that Ellen White could not be trusted in historical and medical matters or even in administrative and theological issues, where would they stop? If Ellen White could not be considered an authority in these matters, how could she be considered authoritative in others? We do not know the motivation behind the written or public statements of either verbal or thought inspirationist. Generally, however, thought inspirationist contended for the freedom to interpret White on the basis of sound hermeneutical principles such as the application of time, place, and circumstances. And this is what we have just read uh, here uh, previously uh, in uh, 1SM 57.2. Regarding the testimonies, nothing is ignored, nothing is cast aside, but time and place must be considered. Nothing must be done untimely. And so uh, the debate that was raging on could be solved by even just reading 1SM uh, 57.2. But uh, you know how certain works with us sometimes. 
when we don't put all the information today together, and we are told in uh, Sister White's writing that uh, half reformation is worse than infidelity, because somebody will take uh, a message which is not complete and run with it, and they will not want to be told anything. But that is the most dangerous thing. And so uh, we read that um, Ellen White, uh, we do not know the motivation behind the written or public statements of either verbal or thought inspirations. Generally, however, thought inspirationists contended for the freedom to interpret Ellen White on the basis of sound hermeneutical principles such as the application of time, place, and circumstances, such as sought the principle behind the policy. This approach had been best articulated by William White in his remarks regarding the 1911 revision of the Great Controversy. F.M. Wilcox, in general way, at the Council also asserted this coherent, integrating approach to the writings of Ellen White. I would like to ask Brother Daniels if it could be accepted as a sort of rule that Sister White might, might be mistaken in details, but in the general policy and instruction, she was an authority. So you may miss the minute detail in some of her work, but then the general policy and principle of what she has written will guide you into uh, just coming into the specifics of the matter. And sometimes, E.G. White refused to give the specifics of certain matters when she was asked. Uh, like uh, we had um, a board to discuss the years, the children, the years for a child to go to school and also the schools they should attend. I have previously gone through this letter and she refused to answer questions directly. She told them, I'm not here to give you specifics. What was the problem at that time when she was called on the board when her school was being started and they wanted to know her opinion? Some people were arguing based on the book Child Garden or the compilation Child Garden from her other materials. She said uh, the teacher of a child below nine years should only be the mother or the parent. And so people... Um, what they did was this. They did not take their children to school, but on the other hand, their parents were not qualified to teach them. But here now we heard the statement, no child should be taken or no child should be taught by another teacher. Be below the ages of nine, the only teacher should be the parent and mostly the mother. And so we, here we heard a statement, which was taken to be a specific statement instead of taking it as a guiding principle that can open up to many other suggestions concerning that, uh, 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 that statement. So let us take the statement of E.G. White as a specific statement that the, part, that the teacher of the, part of the child below nine years should be the parent and more so the mother. One, if you take that statement specifically, it means that... Uh, uh, what you are seeing in that statement, the father is relieved of teaching the child to some extent. Now we are taking her words literally as verbal inspiration and as a specific statement. The father is relieved from teaching the child to some extent. The mother has this burden of making sure that this child grows up being taught by her. Now, if there is a situation that the mother has no capability of teaching this child and the father has only a limited sense of educating this child. Then it means that between the period of one of zero to nine years, this child, what he or she will be having is what is called street education and street education is not street. That the street education is the child just does what they want. And because there is no teacher to guide them, they, they, they just left to uh, 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 run riot like that. That is street education. But let us take this statement as a principle and not a specific, that the teacher of the child should, below nine years, should be the mother and to some extent the father. Then it means, if we take it by principle, that if there are circumstances that the mother cannot be a teacher, then somebody else can come in and be a teacher. 
and it does not exonerate or free the father from being the teacher if he is free and not only free, by the way, the first missionary is for your children and nothing should preoccupy your time to the, uh, at the expense of bringing up your child. And so if we take it as a principle, then we can find another teacher for this child because the mother or the father are, cannot be able uh, to, 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 to teach the child. Take an example of E.G. White herself when she's saying that um, the only teacher of the part of the child should be the parent and more so the mother. E.G. White herself did never had time to raise up her children. She left the children to the other people to teach or to raise them up. And so here we will have a prophet advising people something he uh, itself can be, not be applied to her. And so if you take it as a verbal inspiration and a specific statement and not as a principle, you have E.G. White as a hypocrite in telling people that uh, the teacher of the children under nine years should be the mother and no one else. You see how it works? And you see this thing, we take it lightly like this because maybe I'm explaining or somebody has explained it. But in 1919, it split the church into two. And it is more important. So when she was called on the board of a school which was starting, she refused to answer these specifics. And she raised a question in that board meeting and said, and uh, and Etty Jones had echoed that statement earlier, but she said them, what advantage will it be to ignore what should be done because the person who should do it is not able to do it? Let us say that uh, there is a hole on the road or there's a hole and there's a person who should cover it. Uh, and we say, we are not going to cover that hole because there is a specific person to cover it. Suppose somebody dies in that hole. Will we be innocent, we who saw it and did not cover it because there was a specific person to do that job? This is how we deal with the issues with the principle. And so she told them, if these children do not have somebody to, their parents have not qualified, and they are not qualified to teach them, then take them to a school where they can be taken care of by people who are able, who understand parenting. And then A.T. Jones said, there was no need for schools in any way, but because we have uh, orphan children with parents, it was uh, the reason why we established the school. And that is a very, very strong statement. Orphans having what? Parents. And not, we are not talking about orphans on the street, living on the street. We are talking about orphans who are living in a house with their parents. They are real parents. Why are they orphans? Because their parents know nothing on how it is to bring up a child. And shall we ignore these children because their parents who brought them on the earth, they are alive, they are living with them, but they can't do the work they are supposed to do. Here is where the church comes in and does the work that uh, the mother or the father cannot do. And so Etijone said, the reason why we have schools, it is because of these orphans who have living parents and living with them. And uh, that was like a rebuke, not just an abuse to uh, uh, maybe parents, but also genuinely there is an education that children need to get which the parents who have brought them on the earth have no clue about it because maybe they have not been uh, acquainted with the material. There are other parents like uh, uh, there are pa other parents who are illiterate completely, but they have brought their children in this world. Shall we point a finger to them and accuse them of not doing what they are supposed to do when they themselves do not know anything? Shall we not do a noble work of educating the parent alongside educating the child also in these matters by hanging on a statement as a verbal inspired statement and a specific statement that no one should be the teacher of the child under nine years. And so I have belabored on that point so much so that we may understand the crisis in 1919 and see how easily Willie White could have solved this issue. And so F.M. Wilcox in general way at the council also asserted this coherent integrating approach to the writings of Ellen White. I will ask to ask, I would like to ask Brother Daniels if it will be accepted as a sort of rule that Sister White must be mistaken in details, but in the general policy and inter instruction, she 
was an authority. Others who contended against the verbal inspirationist did not accept or perhaps did not understand this larger, more constructive reasoning. The thought will be expressed for whatever reason. While I believe that Ellen White is a prophet of God, I do not believe that all she writes and all she says is inspired. In other words, I do not believe in verbal inspiration. That kind of thinking, if not severely modified, is an open door through which many have walked away, walked away from the Adventist church over the years. Such a thinking leads to personal judgment as to what a prophet means as to, and to personal judgment as to what is inspired and what is not. This is truly a slippery slope if there is not a prevailing fundamental message to hold on to. At least verbal inspiration is new in their minds how to hang on to authority, even if it might not have been for the right reason. Those of this group, and there were many who remain in the church as strong leaders in administration and evangelism, believe that they were the only ones left who could save the denomination from apostasy by holding firmly to verbal inspiration. By the way, I don't hold to verbal inspiration, but thought inspiration. They could point to many who try to reinterpret Ellen White as examples of where such a thinking will lead others. Men such as Bellinger Brothers, AF and ECS, J.H. Kellogg, H. Jones, W.A. Colcord, E.J. Wagner, L. Rady, L. R. Conradi, and W. W. Fletcher. Now, it is always that uh, we throw away the bathwater with the towel, uh, with the baby, uh, because some mistakes have been made in something, we all together throw it away, not picking what is the best and leaving what is uh, wrong. Even the Bible itself says, test the spirit, hold on to that which is good and reject that which is not good. But here, uh, seeing that uh, those who held to some view had apostatized, it was a means of rejecting that view altogether, which was another point where they went off the road. Common to all these highly visible leaders who defected from, the, from uh, defected was their decision that the spirit of prophecy would be divided into inspired and uninspired portions. It seems relevant that in most cases, those who began to make such a determinations eventually lost confidence in the spirit of prophecy. Number six of the problem in 1919 conference. Evident that uh, the conference council did not appear to change anyone's mind is reflected in later comments. On one hand, A.G. Daniels wrote to Willie White that we stand together more unitedly and firmly for all the fundamentals than we began the meeting. But was this true in the later commission Little room to write on the issue of the Holy Spirit, an action that gave birth to compiling evangelism, which painted an idea that was foreign to E.G. Ellen White. On the other, Jesh Washburn, a highly visible representative of those who opposed Prescott and Daniels on their position concerning the Daily, the Eastern Question, ETC, wrote an open letter to Daniels and the General Conference Committee expressing the concern of many. In referring to this so-called Bible Institute, where teachers were undermining the confidence of our sons and daughters in the very fundamental of our truth, he quoted, one of our most faithful workers who said that the Institute was the most terrible thing that had ever happened in the history of this denomination. The issues that surfaced, surfaced in the 1919 19 Conference Council remain today, reflected in at least three of the four positions that divide Christians generally and Adventists specifically. Point number A, those when the church was split into two, it was also divided into four uh, factions. Those who believed that biblical writers and Ellen White were inspired but were not given propositional truth. B, those who hold that biblical writers and Ellen White received divinely dictated truth and that their message were given as God wanted the writings to be read or heard, that is verbal inspirationist. C, those who believe that the Bible and the writings of Ellen White are divinely inspired by God impressing thoughts on the prophet's minds who will then convey the message in the best language and thought frames at their disposal. And this is my position, that is thought inspirationist. And uh, I'll be reading a section of uh, E.G. White material where she says that uh, the Bible is not the language of God. It is not dictated by the Lord, but the Lord embraces the thoughts on the mind of the prophet or the writer. And then he writes in the language that he understands and it can help the church. Those who believe that the Bible and the writings of Ellen White are generally inspired by their value is more pastoral than theological. And uh, this is where we are right now. From 2015, 
officially the denomination believes that uh, E.G. White's materials cannot solve theological matters, but they are pastoral in nature. And uh, I can uh, give you the documents of that discussion. Brothers and sisters, here we stand again. And uh, what shall we say about the things that have transpired and uh, E.G. White uh, and uh, the denomination without uh, a prophet? In Psalms 11 verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We are told in Jeremiah 6, 16, that seek ye the right path and follow it, but others have said we shall not. And so, uh, uh, I want to visit this issue of uh, the thought inspiration and the Bible, uh, the language of the Bible. And I want just to take you to one essay from page 19 going downwards as we close in a few minutes. Uh, whatever she had to say about the Bible, is it a dictation or the mind of the prophet is worked on? In uh, 1 SM 19.3, she says, the writers of the Bible had to express their ideas in human language. It was written by human men. These men were inspired of the Holy Spirit. It was not dictated. Because of the imperfections of human understanding of language or the perversity of the human mind, ingenious in evading truth, many read and understand the Bible to please themselves. It is not that the difficulty is in the Bible. Opposing politicians argue points of law in the statute book and take opposite views in the application and in this uh, laws. The scripture were, were given to men not in a continuous chain of un unbroken utterances. This is dictation but piece by piece through successive generation as God in his providence saw a fitting opportunity to impress man at sundry times and diverse places. Men wrote as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. There is first the bud, then the blossom, and next the fruit, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. This is exactly what the Bible utterances are to us. And so, um, Again, she had to say this, the Bible is not given to us in grand superhuman language. Jesus, in order to reach men where he is, took humanity. The Bible must be given in the language of men. Everything that is human is imperfect. Different meanings are expressed by the same word. There is not a one word for each distinct idea. The Bible was given for practical uh, purposes. And then... Uh, she had to say, the Lord speaks to human beings in imperfect speech in order that the degenerate senses, the dull earthly perception of earthly beings may comprehend his words. Thus is shown God's condemnation. He meets fallen human beings where they are. The Bible, perfect as it is in its simplicity, does not answer to the great ideas of God. For infinite ideas cannot be perfectly embodied in infinite vehicles of thought. Instead of the expression of the Bible being exaggerated, as many people suppose, the strong expression breaks down before the magnificent of the thought. And we have that word, the thought. Though the penmen selected the most expressive language through which to convey the truth of higher education, sinful beings can only bear to look upon a shadow of the brightness of heaven's uh, glory. And then the last thing, uh, the Bible points to God as its author, yet it was written by human hands. And in the varied style of its different books, it presents the characteristics of the several writers. The truth revealed are all given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, yet they are expressed in the words of man. The infinite one by his Holy Spirit has shed light into the minds and hearts of his servants. He has given dreams and visions, symbols and figures, and, and those to whom the truth was thus revealed has themselves embodied the thought in human language. So the Bible is a thought-inspired book, not a verbal dictated book. And so uh, lastly, uh, uh, in 1SM, we read this. 
21. The Bible is written by inspired men, but it's not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God as a writer is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God, but God has not put himself in words, in logic, in rhetoric, on trial, in the Bible. The writers of the Bible were God's penmen, not his pen. Look at the different writers. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired. It is not a verbally inspired thing. We read it is a thought inspired thing. But the men that were inspired, it is not the words but the men. Inspiration acts not on man's words or his expression but on the man himself, who under the influence of the Holy Ghost is imbued with thoughts. But the words receive the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind is diffused. The divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will. Thus the utterances of the man are the word of God. And so this is thought inspiration and not verbal inspiration. Standing here today, can we say these words together in standing here today? Can we be able to say these words? In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say praise God. As I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as a leader. As leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Life sketches 196 paragraph 2. Can we confidently, after the demise of E.G. White, say such a words that we have nothing to fear? Yet, as we speak right now, there is many things to fear and more so amongst us than we can fear from the outside. And so may the Lord help us as we shall be looking at the last two presentations. Where have we gone wrong and what should we rectify and come back to the truth? Otherwise, shall we pray as we bring this to a close? Our loving Father, glory and honor be unto thee that many changes have taken place. It is naive to deny. But how we pray that uh, if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? But uh, seek the right paths and walk in them and uh, contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We need strength, wisdom, and courage to do this in Jesus' name. Amen.